Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Kyle Report wherever you get your podcast. You're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media, that's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in and you can read my work on ESPN.com. And I like doing these intros with the guest with me today, Sam Fortier, because I think this is his favorite part is to hear me say hello and welcome to my podcast. So Sam, hello and welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It, uh... I, I, it's one of the bits that I think will live forever. I was recently in Mobile, Alabama at the Senior Bowl, and I, I, I drove home actually with Matthew Paris. Uh, we went back to New Orleans. I was flying out of there, and uh, on the ride home, we FaceTimed Pete Haley. He was in his office in Stamford, Connecticut, and I think immediately one of the bits that we did was, was hello and welcome to the FaceTime. <laughs> That's, all right, great. You know what? Maybe I should get a T-shirt made with that on there. There so you go. Anyways, I haven't had a chance to talk to you in a while, or at least not on Zoom, where your mom, shout out Mrs. 48, can hear us chat. So, but I am curious, you know, a lot of things have changed since we last since I last had you on. I wanna I wanna point out for listeners real quick that time texted me frantically. He was in the supermarket buying pork belly, and so he needed a guest for today. And he was like, Hey, can you help? And uh, you know, 10 minutes earlier or something, my mom had texted me. Hey, have you done any podcasts recently? Recently, I, I miss hearing you, especially on John or something like that. And so I was like, all right, if those two things are going to happen at the same time, <laughs> I can clear my busy schedule to, to talk to Kyle for a couple minutes. There, there you go. And um, yeah, so I'm glad she chipped in. So anyway, a lot of things have happened. And we're coming at the end of the week where we're, you know, all that, all that good stuff. Some coaches have been Cliff Kingsbury, Joe Witt. I'm curious so far what your impression of their offseason has been. I would say after the Ben Johnson debacle, you know, sniping back and forth, it, it's been very good. I, I would say that you got to give them the benefit of the doubt. I think Dan Quinn is, is putting together an impressive staff, particularly with the additions of, of Brian Johnson and, and Jason Simmons. Um, I think those are guys who are going to help, who are addressing positions of need. Um, and so to me, I would say, there's nothing they've done so far that is like ringing alarm bells or that I say, oh, that that can't work out. I do think there are reasons to be skeptical, to doubt, okay, like can a Cliff Kingsbury offense really help a young quarterback develop? I, I, I would give the benefit of the doubt right now. I would lean on the optimistic side. But if you wanted to present a case to be pessimistic about these things, I think you could. Uh, but when you ask for my take, I would say so far, so good. Uh, but a lot remains to be seen, right? Because we have the free agency, we have the draft. Those are two major building blocks for what this team is going to be in the fall. And you know, the, the funny thing, Sam, with Brian Johnson, you bring him up and he has a reputation that in talking to people in Philly, that he's really good with quarterbacks. So it lends another helping hand in the development of a quarterback. And I also think, I know the reaction from Eagles fans was, oh my gosh, good luck with that guy. Well, a year ago, he's one of the hot young assistants in the NFL and one of the rising young guys in the NFL. And in talking to some people up there, I think they felt one person felt um, that maybe he was a little bit hamstrung by Sirianni as you know, in, in that role. But I know someone else has like said kind of the same thing, like the organization kind of didn't really help him out. So I don't, you know, we'll see what it is, but he's coming here in a different role. So to me, that's, you know, he's coming here to develop a quarterback. I think in the offensive staff, you have two guys in Brian Johnson and Cliff Kingsbury that have not succeeded in the jobs above where they're at now, right? right? Like Cliff was not a great head coach. Brian Johnson was not a great offensive coordinator for whatever reasons those might be. But you have to trust, hey, Cliff Kingsbury has a strong track record of developing good offenses. Brian Johnson has a strong track record of helping develop quarterbacks. You have to trust, hey, these guys, if they're if they're devoting their time and energies into the thing that they've proven they're good at, this is going to be a better offense and they're going to be better for it. And these guys will, you know, with Cliff, I'm, I'm a little bit more skeptical with Brian. I think it makes more sense that they can develop their skills to take another shot at those at those big jobs that they had once. So I see those guys as actually very similar stages of their career right now. And I, and I would, I think that's well put. I, they, they did not, they're going to different roles than what they had previously. What's your skepticism with Kingsbury? I, I think that uh, when you talk about an air raid offense, the guy's going to be in gun a lot. And I don't think that there are a ton of examples of young quarterbacks succeeding in a mostly gun system. And I say that because, 
and, and I know it goes deeper than that. And I know that he played a ton of gun in Arizona because of Kyler's stature. And, you know, he needed to be able to see over the line. Like that's a real thing of why you go gun. But in four years, the lowest rate that Kingsbury used gun was 88%. And I think, you know, last year in Indianapolis, Anthony Richardson was in gun 96% of the time in only like 200 something snaps. But I think that there is, um, you don't get the same action you don't get the same reaction from defenses when you go soft play action at a gun as opposed to hard play action at under center um and i think that greg olson made a great point on twitter a couple weeks ago where he said look at the young quarterbacks who have had success this year jordan love brock purdy cj stroud all of those guys are in west coast offenses where you get under center on first and second down and you have a hard play action and you make a defense respect it and i think that that is a, a big part of their success and so i'm not saying you can't succeed in this system if you're just going air raid you're going gun whether it be caleb or drake or Jaden or whomever but i just think that when you look at the most recent ways in which young quarterbacks have succeeded it is not the way that you are going to approach it probably i i would agree with that i think the hard part with we've seen that before in the past when you're running out of gun a lot it's just hard to marry those as a, the big phrase marry the concepts and i think it's been hard to do that when you're in those kind of situations and, you know, shoot, you even look at Detroit with Ben Johnson, you know, um, the way their offense ran it, heavy play action, a lot of under center and not that that's the only way to do it, but it is. And it could also be why, like maybe the air raid did not continue to excel in Arizona in the second half of some of those seasons. And I know that I know also that, you know, you could do things like get in pistol. So the action is harder, but I just, it just, to me, like there is something about going under center that, that, helps a, a young quarterback. And I will say um, in, in, on, a, on a personal note, in 2017, um, I went down to Lubbock, Texas to do a story about college football team chaplains, to do a story kind of about, about what that was like to be in a college program with those. It was when Davo Sweeney was like baptizing kids, uh, you know, DeAndre Hopkins on the field or whatever. Um, and it just so happened that the, the head coach at Texas Tech at the time was Cliff Kingsbury. And when I was there, uh, he was going into year five, the year he ultimately got fired. But one of his things that year was that he was trying to show the defensive players that he cared about them. The defense did not feel like he he, had, he would celebrate their success or he cared about them as much as the offense, obviously, which was his background. And that was the thing that he was trying to address at the time. And so, you know, everybody would tell me in the building, oh, like Cliff gets here at 4 a.m., first one in, last one out. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'm not here for this story, but whatever. And then one day I was like, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna go see. I'm going to get up at 345, which is, I know when you're up anyway. Uh, so, so I'm going to walk down, you know, so I walked out of the Texas Tech football facility and I sat on the front steps and it was 4 a.m. in Lubbock. Uh, and at 4.06 a.m., a white Escalade pulls into the parking lot and out steps Cliff Kingsbury. And he and I walk into the facility and, you know, he's getting a workout in. But I spent a little bit of time with him and, you know, I went to his office and he had, you know, the the on the whiteboard, he had, you know, the X's and O's in, in red and green, you know, marker. And, and he was diagramming plays. That is what he loves to do. And so I think that when the Arizona Cardinals started fast and would fade down the stretch every year, I think. A part of that, I imagine, is he had the entire offseason to kind of create and think and scheme. And the demands of the head coaching job prevent you from staying on top of those things, yeah. uh, encountering uh, defenses throughout the year. So I think that when one of the reasons I'm more optimistic, despite the reasons I just said for the gun and, and the air raid and things like that, one of the reasons I'm optimistic is if you let him cook, if you let him focus on the offense the entire year, I have a greater degree of belief that he'll figure it out and stay ahead of the curve. Let Cliff cook. Is that what the, is that the new phrase now? <laughs> that, that, let, let them all cook, man. Well, I also think the other part of it too, and I think this is something from Dan Quinn's perspective that what he's trying to set up here is something that I don't think he felt like he had in Atlanta, which is a plan of succession. So let's say in a best case scenario that they come here, you know, he comes here and they, whoever they draft, whether it's Jaden Daniels, or Drake May, I'm always going to mention both of them because if you don't mention both of them together, someone else says, well, what about this? So Drake May or Jaden Daniels? Well, what, what about, about what about Caleb? <laughs> well, I'm just assuming Chicago picks him. Well, but what if Washington trades up? All right. In this exercise, Chicago <laughs> picks him. So I'm just taking these two. But yes. But, but I'm Caleb, saying for the, for the rest of draft season, I want you to think when you say Caleb or Drake, 
Oh, or uh, when you say Drake or Jaden, Sam, Sam might say Caleb. Well, I'm surprised someone out there and say, yeah, but what about Bo Nix if you trade back? So No, no, no. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> so anyway, let's say they stay at two and it's Drake Mayer, Jaden Daniels. Okay. And um, they, they have success. And in two years, Cliff Kingsbury leaves. Well, if you have Brian Johnson in your staff, you can now elevate him into that role. So you can keep some continuity within that system if that's how you set it up. I think in Atlanta, they did not really have that. Kyle left and a lot of those guys left with them rather than him promoting those guys just kind of all left. I think that's important too. And I want to point out that if Cliff Kingsbury leaves for a head coaching job or if he gets poached or whatever, it's like that would good. be one of the best things to happen to right. this franchise in a long time. Like I mean, it'd be a success. Yeah. Yeah. Pe people should not be afraid of that. You know, no, if he it's comes what in, you want. right, exactly. So uh, yes, I, I think that setting up a succession plan, um, is really great. And if, and if that happens, you and I are going to start making references to, to Tom Wamsgans and, and Greg Hirsch. And... <laughs> you know, I saw a clip from that show yesterday. I'm like, I've got to go back and watch it again now. Cause it's been what a year almost um, something like that. Something like that. So what, you know, what other direction do you think this franchise needs to go with as far as, you know, let's look at some of the player decisions, some of the top player decisions of Curtis Samuel, Antonio Gibson, Cam Curl. What would you, what do you think, should be done at this point with them one of i mean there's a couple directions i could take this um i think the receiver position is going to be really important because if you know cliff kingsbury the air raid like he uses a lot of four receiver sets and they only have four receivers under contract who took an offensive snap last year one of them being mitchell tinsley who took like three offensive snaps um but the, the way that i'm going to take this is you bring in dan quinn to be a defensive guy joe witt um i'm curious what this defense looks like and i think that the number one question I have, because it's the soonest deadline, the deadline is, is March 5th, is are they going to franchise tag Cam Curl? And I I, I, I don't know. I'm skeptical because it would be $17.2 million. That's the estimate right now and over the cap. I think that's probably a, a little rich for someone of, of his production. But at the same time, I do think Cam is, is an important part of this defense. He raises the floor tremendously, even though he hasn't made those splash plays. Um, and, and I wonder... You know, if I'm Dan Quinn and I want to say, OK, you know, I need smart guys and, and Cam is clearly that um, to help establish, you know, the back end of my defense. You know, what are they going to do with him? Um, I think that's that's probably, you know, the thing that I would I would say. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because I would not put the franchise. I think that's a, that's rich for where Cam is at as far as a playmaker. I really I like what he adds. And I think they need to find a way to keep him. I don't know that I think you can do that without the tag, but that's just me. Um, but, but I don't, that's. Are you saying, are you saying you can do it pre free agency? Because I, I don't think you can get him to a long-term deal before free agency starts, probably, unless you, unless you overpay by quite prob a bit. Prob probably the case. I don't know that I would put the tag on him though. I just think that's an awful, I think once you like, I think that's, and I, I haven't studied the numbers at this point, but to me, tag suggests a pretty high guy at your position. And I don't know that I, as much as like, I think he adds a lot, but I think the guys that you give that to have to be playmakers to me. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to go to that level, because once you get to that level, the salary starts there, you can't start there and go down. So that would be my concern is what is that the best use of your resources? And if you're, if they're so, they're very big on analytics, as you know. So what would the analytics say about paying the safety that much? if they're not making the kind of plays that change games. I think the value of Cam is that he sometimes prevents big play. He a lot of times prevents big plays from being made because he's in the right spot. He's versatile. I love the guy as far as a, a defensive piece for this team. And everybody I talk to says, you got to sign that guy. But I don't know about that, that high. You could just franchise tag him twice. You know, that's that that this organization. I, I'm I'm making a joke. I, I don't know if that went over people's heads about Brandon Sheriff, but like, be like too soon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think you're probably right. Um, the the question though, I would say is if you got to keep him, if you got to sign him to a long term deal. I mean, if he's going to go to free agency, I think there's going to be there's going to be a demand for his services. I mean, he's, I think um, he's probably one of the. 20 to 30 best free agents on the market. And when you get to the market, you're, you max out your leverage. If, if you're a, if you're a player, if you're an agent. So I wonder, you know, what is his market? Is it 
13 a year, 14 a year, 15 a year. I mean, that, that would be rich. That would be top five, top seven safety money. But it's, are you willing to pay that? And what is the premium that you're willing to pay to, to not let, to not get him there. You know, I think right. that's the question that I have for Adam Peters, if that's even on his radar right now. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't know. And um, again, he's a valuable piece. I just, I think there's a limit as to where you're going to go with him. Then I also wonder too, like what, how does, what their, the, their thoughts on Quan Martin, their force and how they view them. But I think like those three together can be really good. And, you know, as a, as a trio, so I would do what I could to keep him because again, I think that versatility, and then you have a, I think one of the things that you saw with Dan Quinn in Dallas is his ability to maximize what a guy does. And I think that's where Cam can fit in very well is that. And, but again, there's, that's a different conversation than the money part of it. Where are you willing to go with it? <clears throat> Cause you know, yes, they have the cap space. They also have to sign a few guys to get to that limit. Right. Just, and then you're going to have to sign some other guys. And so it's not, I think that money, I don't know if it's going to go fast, but it's not, I don't expect them to be these crazy, crazy spenders like Dan Snyder when he was first here. But I, you know, you have a lot of things you've got to fill with it too. So got to find some defensive ends, Sam. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the other one is, is Antonio Gibson. And in this kind of style of offense, could he be really good? Is this a better fit for him? But you got, two running backs already here. And for him, would he want to come back knowing that Rodriguez is here and Robinson is here? And, and but I'm the other part of that is how do they see those two guys in that style? It would have to be a, a market thing, right? Because I think that if, if you can get Antonio Gibson for not that much money, uh, I, I think he's a valuable tool, a, a valuable piece to have in your offense because he is explosive. And I know that Brian Robinson played, made more explosive plays and he was, you know, a truly, versatile guy last year but I just don't think they ever figured out really how to use AG and I don't just mean the Eric B I mean I mean Scott Turner you know like he I, I just don't think that he was ever maximized here um but again if, if there's a team that really likes him who has a real vision for AG and they're willing to pay for it then I think it, it you know it kind of gets out of range but yeah it, it, it's how does he fit in the broader system it, can he I would imagine that just given what I know some scouts like of AG, you know, what some scouts think of AG, that he will have a more robust market. But with running backs, it's always, you know, it's always hard to tell um, what that second contract is really going to look like. Right. He's a big guy who can catch. And that's a good thing in this market because you think he can have a longer career because he's not going to be this, you know, middle of the field pounder for however many years. So he can have a longer career with that. But I don't know if for him, he may just get to the point where you say, you know, I know it's a new regime, but I keep hearing every year that they're going to use me a certain way and then it doesn't happen. I'm going to go somewhere else where they're going to tell me that and maybe pay me more. So that that's the other part of it. Um, with quarterbacks, have you, how much, first of all, you're down at the senior bowl. What kind of things did you pick up down there um, that maybe stayed with you? I think the medicals are going to be a really big deal for Michael Penix. And that's not like a huge take for a guy that's torn an ACL multiple times, but I mean, he has zip, like the ball comes out of his hand, right? And, you know, we saw that that throw he made up the middle um, in the playoff semifinal. But I think that Penix, to me, has the inside track for, for QB4 over Bo Nix. Um, I know that some guys believe that they're different schematically, um, but I just, I just like Penix. Uh, I think he throws a really good ball. Um, Bo Nix, uh, I think it seems to me – and, and I had one scout tell me this, that he needs more of a defined offense to to um, to succeed in, whereas Penix maybe, you know, you could you could be a little more versatile with him. Um, but th those are those are kind of my my broad takeaways from from the senior bowl. I, I, I thought both of them handled the, uh, you know, handled the microscope really well, um, made a good first impression uh, on the NFL level. Um, Penix had a couple of really nice throws, a couple of nice deep balls. Um but that, that that was, you know, really my, my broad strokes takeaways. So when you look at the quarterback side, because obviously the guys that we're going to talk about for the next two and a half, three months, we're not there. But ha I don't know, you know, do you have an early lead or or guy that you think might be a coming here as a better fit or maybe just, you know, between obviously between May and right now between May and Daniels. I get to Caleb in a second. 
Yeah, we can't talk about Caleb Lewis. Um, I mean, look, you talked about this. I think I saw a tweet that where, where you were saying, don't think hiring Cliff Kingsbury immediately means Caleb because like Drake May has experience in the air raid. You know, I know Jaden Daniels played in the air raid his, his freshman year, you know, early on, certainly when he was at um, Arizona State. I mean, one of the things that I think that people are not talking about and I'm, and I'm early on, right? Like I'm, I just turned on um, some of the, I actually, I'm actually watching Caleb tape right now, like early, um, even though I know it's probably Drake or Jaden if they stay at two, but I've just, I've started watching Caleb more, started digging into the stats on these guys. Um, but it does strike me like how good Jaden Daniels was throwing the ball down the field last year. Like Drake may was very good. Don't get me wrong, but like Jaden Daniels was the best in the league like if it, on throws of 20 plus yards jane daniels had 27 touchdowns and zero picks like the dude pushed the ball down the field in a really impressive way and, and if you go back and look at cliff kingsbury's offenses in arizona with kyler who obviously you know has a nice arm like he was pushing the ball down the field at, at some of the highest rates in the league like they take shots and they look for explosives and dan quinn said like this team is going to be expl-. one of the two adjectives he used was explosive and so if I'm thinking, okay, how, you know, how are they going to accomplish that? Those two guys are, are certainly leaders in the clubhouse. Although I will say I watched Caleb versus UCLA the other day and he had this throw where he was climbing in the pocket and he like, he threw it like a javelin, like 50 yards in the air. And it was just a beautiful ball. And it's like, all right, I, I see, I see why, you know, a lot of people consider this dude, the top guy in the class. And so I know I'm kind of undercutting your, uh, your take about, don't think Caleb's going to come here and we're focused on Drake or Jaden, but that's just where my head's at. Oh no. And I don't know that that's going to happen. Like my only point is for the purpose of this exercise, because yeah. I'm assuming that Chicago is going to take him, but what would you give up again? Caleb is the top guy in this class. What would you give? What would you be comfortable with them giving up to move up to that spot? Well, it's funny. Your colleague, Tim Hasselbeck was on your network earlier today saying that he, he's not sold on Caleb being the number one kid. In this I, know class. He's he also, not. I know that, he, which, which is interesting to me. Um, what would I give up? I mean, to go from two to one, is, I mean, but there's a, obviously, you know, if there's competitors, you, you, you at a minimum have to give up next year's one, right? So it's two ones. I would say, you know, two ones and a three, does that get it done? Two ones and a, and a two, if it's next year's two, like, does that get it done? I, I think that, you want to avoid the the 49ers trade up for Lance. I mean, they went from, I think it was like 12 to three, right? They gave up three first round picks. Um, but I think if you can get, if you can get it for two first rounders and, you know, another mid round pick, another early to mid, whether it be second or third, I think, I think that would be suitable. If you believe that Caleb is like far and away the guy, if you believe that he has a much higher hit rate he has a much higher chance of being that guy for the next 10 to 15 years, then I think you do it. And I know that this organization has not always had a great track record with giving up, you know, a lot of assets to move up in the first round. They've not had a great track record of bringing hometown heroes in, you know, with, with Chase Young. I think that's a totally legitimate consideration for this. And Dwayne. And, and Dwayne. But if, if you're Adam Peters and you put on the film and you talk to your guys and you talk to everyone and you say, okay, Caleb is clearly the number one guy. Then I think you, I, I think you're, you're totally justified in giving up what it takes to go get him. And I guess the one thing I would wonder too is, would Chicago, if you're Chicago, yeah. you could, you might be able to get more and still move down to three or even later and still get a guy you really want, and you may be able to cash in more than what you get from Washington, which then raises the price for Washington. That's the hard part. That's the one hard part in all this. And as someone else told me, like. If so, people are going to give up this much for Caleb Williams, shouldn't that tell Chicago maybe, maybe you should go draft that guy instead? But, you know, I think it, everything at this point, it's what, February 8th? Everything's on the table. So it's going to be discussed because we have almost three months to the draft. So everything will be discussed about 300 times. Bless you. If you can't see, you couldn't hear Sam or see Sam. But he's sitting there sneezing with the mute button. Hey, I hit the mute button, man. I I, I worked in radio I, once. I hit the cough button. <laughs> I I appreciate that. So I, but I do listen. You have to put it on the table and discuss it because there is a tie there. And and if Chicago somehow says they want to hold on to Justin Fields for another year or two, even though they have to pay him, and you wouldn't have to pay Caleb. But what if they do? And what, what if they say like, 
you know, maybe it's better to do that and then get all these picks and build. So there's a lot of things to look at with this. And then from this team, do you really want to give up all those picks? But we'll see. Like, that's going to be a very big discussion because you're right. He is that good. And most, I know what Hasselbeck has said, and he's been consistent on that. And there's some other people who think like they'll, they'll point out a Jaden Daniels or Drake May is the best guy. Um, but most people I've, that I've talked to early on would say Caleb because he's just different. You watch him, the kid is different. He's electric. And so I think, it, but, you know, then it's, we'll see. But um, last thing is, so you and Nikki had the story in Eric the enemy that ran, it's Thursday, we'll take him this Thursday. So I'm just curious, you know, what, what your takeaway with that piece was. And, and basically it explains and, you know, wrote a variation of this during the season about what went wrong this season. This is about why he wasn't retained or promoted, or whatever, how you want to phrase it. So what did, what was your takeaway from that? Yeah, we wanted to explain to readers basically why Eric Bieniemy, who arrived a year ago, to great fanfare, to seemingly taking the next step toward this long-awaited promotion to head coach, why didn't it work out? Why did Dan Quinn arrive and one of the first major decisions was to fire this guy? And so we went through and just kind of explained to people um, it was a combination of, of factors. I think Quinn wanted to bring in his own guy. We, you know, he talked about he didn't like facing Cliff Kingsbury and he was on the list of guys who would like to bring in. I think um, second, the offense was unbalanced and ineffective for a lot of the season. And then the third one that we wanted to contextualize it is there was tension between Eric Bieniemy and his players. You know, Logan Thomas spoke about this on the record after the last game, just saying, Hey, we had our ups and downs with Eric Bieniemy and we have some players. We, we quoted them anonymously because we wanted them to feel free to speak candidly about internal team dynamics and, I mean, they described EB as a hardworking coach, but he sometimes hamstrung his own work um, with poor communication, stubborn play calling, and a disregard for player feedback. And I think that um, it's important to note that players can sometimes feel that way about a coach, but if, if people are winning, it's okay. Uh, but I think that when something like this happens and you're losing and you know, you're know you not trying new things, people get frustrated. So it's not meant to be a hit piece. It's not meant to tear him down, but it is, it is an explanation of for people who are there every day as Nikki and I, and you are, when, when you say, why did this not work out? These are the pieces of evidence that we found to say, this is what happened. Yeah. And I even talked to player at the end of the year. I said, what's the key for our coordinators? Like to, they wanted to be collaborative. So anyway, but yeah, but anyway, the enemy's gone and there's a new staff here, Sam, tell people where they can find you. You can find me on, on Twitter at or X or whatever, S-A-M, the number four, T-R. You can find me in the Washington Post, WashingtonPost.com. Um, yeah. And blue Sky. I don't need, Do you know what Blue Sky is? Um, I know Gray Skies right now, so I'm looking outside. I do not know Blue Sky. I'm not on threads either. Threads, yeah. I, I mean, like, I'm on there, but I, I don't really use it that much. I, I mean, it does feel like uh, – it does. I don't know. Like, I feel like Twitter, I I don't, I still don't love it. You know, like the new, the new Twitter, it's the for you page. I'm not a huge fan. I know some people are, but uh, yeah, you can find me there if, if, if that works. There you go. So thanks a lot. Shout out Miss Fortier and appreciate you coming on Sam. Yeah. Thank you for having me, man.